So what I'd like to do is I'd like to derive the belt friction equation. This derivation I did in class, but I'm uh, recording this to supplement the lectures and put it online. So this is the equation, and it describes how a tension and a belt changes as a function of the, the contact static friction coefficient between the belt and some surface. Let's say this round rod that it's wrapped around and beta is the contact angle. So think about this um, uh, disc or rod. It's a center is right here and you may want to make it rotate in this direction. Well it may want to rotate in that direction caused by having a belt laid on it and wrapped around it and then there's friction in the contact of the belt and you have a lower tension in this side of the belt than on this side of the belt, which has a higher tension, T1. And so if it was just, a, a, let's say, a frictionless pulley right here, a frictionless, it could rotate. If you did have T2 greater than T1, then the pulley or the flywheel or the rod would start rotating, and it would start rotating in that uh, counterclockwise direction. You could stop it from rotating if you applied a moment in the clockwise direction and then that would balance out this imbalance in the tensions. So what we're going to study is that you wrap around, think of this as a belt or a rope, uh, around some flywheel or something that has, let's say, an applied moment to restrain or keep it stationary. And then what we have is a relationship that T2 is equal to T1 times the exponential of the static friction coefficient mu sub s times beta. And in this case, beta would go, it's this contact length or this contact angle going from this contact point over to this contact point. That would be pi radians. So that's what the beta would be for this problem as shown. Well, beta doesn't have to be pi. In this uh, illustration, the contact point for the belt starts here and then ends here, and so beta is going to be less than. Maybe it uh, looks like it's around three-quarters pi in this example, beta. And what we want to do is we want to uh, derive that expression relating T2 and T1, that belt equation. So what do we do? First of all, if you just did a free body diagram of this drum or this flywheel, maybe you would have that moment to hold it stationary. Maybe you would have some supporting force at maybe this point O, O in the X, and maybe O in the Y, something like that. Um, but we're really interested in the force this is a distribution of forces that the belt applies to the surface of this flywheel. And so you can see that there's a bunch of small, as I've tried to depict them, frictional forces, DFs, that are making it want to spin in the counterclockwise direction. Likewise, there's a bunch of normal, I didn't show them in illustration, normal forces, DNs, pushing down into the surface. Well, from the perspective of the belt, the frictional forces are equal and opposite. So I'm trying to show a bunch of small DF. This matches that one. Likewise, this one would match that one, etc., all the way around to match. So equal and opposite. But this is a distribution of little forces uh, on little chunks of the belt. So what we'll do to drive that equation is we'll focus on one chunk of the belt. So here is a cutaway and so there's one chunk of the belt right here and what we're going to do is we're going to develop a free body diagram for that belt. So we know that there's a tension on this side of the belt called that T and tension on this let's say left side of the belt. Well on the left side uh, as it would be naturally increasing in tension. So let's stay with that. So T plus DT. So what is DT? That's the increase in tension. At this little chunk of belt centered about this line, and we're going to talk about having an angle 
d theta. So the small little angle, the radius r is going to drop out. It's really not that important. And, but the angle d theta is important. And so you're thinking about uh, half a d theta on one side and then half a d theta on the other side. And this is intention that way. Now that's not the only forces acting on it. You also have a little df, a little frictional force, and a little dn. So we have dn, df, and the tensions t and t plus dt. You can tell again that this dt is positive because this df is in that direction. So when we also introduce a coordinate system, so this is our x and this is our y. Our y is radial straight out and our x is tangential. Because of the little d theta over 2 on both sides, you can tell that the tangent force right here coming off that sm sl uh, small section of the free body diagram of that belt is also at an angle d theta over 2 and likewise on this side uh, d theta over 2. So you're going to see a lot of d thetas over 2. There's four of them here, right? This one, d theta over 2, d theta over 2, etc. So we have our small normal force on that section of the belt, small friction force in that section of the belt, and the tension in that belt with the change in tension as you go and change from this location to that location, uh, angle of theta. So for this little section, we want some equilibrium equations. We've cho I've chosen to write it, like a lot of textbooks do, in the x and in the y direction. So the equilibrium equation in the x, you can see this t plus dt, and then you have a little triangle. So what you're going to pick off is that component. This is like the hypotenuse of the triangle. You're going to pick off the cosine of that small angle d theta over 2. And then you have an other opposite direction, df, which is along the axis of x, plus t times the cosine of d theta over 2. So this is trying to pull it, let's say, to the upper um, left, and this is to the lower right. That's our x balance equation. So some of the forces in the y, dn pushing it out. We have t plus dt with the sine of d theta over 2. That's trying to bring it back in, in, in uh, that direction, as well as t times sine of d theta over 2. So we get our two equilibrium equations. Then we look at them for a while. Let me clean this up a little bit. And then we make some observations that we're going to be interested in the small angle theta or d theta, very small. Sometimes uh, maybe you're exposed to in calculus epsilon is something very small and the limit epsilon goes to zero. Well, the same idea here is d theta is very small. We just made it large enough to visualize, but we're interested in uh, differential d theta, so very, very small. So if you have the sine of a small angle, it's equal to the small angle or the small angle over two, it would be the small angle over two. Likewise, the cosine of something small is approximately one. So these are approximations. You come up here and you say, oh, this is replaced by one. This is replaced by one. This is replaced by d theta over two. And this is replaced by d theta over two. When you do that, our modified equilibrium equations look like this. So we have t plus dt equal to df plus t. And dn is equal to as, just as it's written. Well, here are the same equations copied over. The next approximation is in the x equation, cancel the t's. So we have a t and a t on this side. So the x equation just turns out to be dt equal to df. And for the y equation, we see that we have something t times something small. But what we have is dt, that's also small, times something small. So whenever you have in these differential equations or difference equations, I should say, small times small, well, small times small is infinitesimal or negligible. So we neglect the 
dt times d theta over 2 term, that multiplier. All right, well, when you do that, the x equation, as written, is just dt is equal to df, and the y equation is dn is equal to t d theta. So we've really reduced our equilibrium equations. We continue to work on those equilibrium equations. What do we do? Well, we think about the belt is at the point of slipping, so there's a relationship between that frictional force and that normal force through that coefficient of static friction. So df we can replace by mu sub s dn. The second thing we can do is we can combine algebraically these equations because what is dn? Well, dn is t d theta. So when you do that, what you do is you, this is the x equation. Then you replace for dn is t d, d theta. And then you have this equation, and then you just bring that d theta over, so you have t over d theta. That's a derivative. That's the rate of change of the tension in the belt with respect to that angle, as we defined it in our illustration, moving in that counterclockwise direction, equal to the coefficient mu sub s of static friction times the current tension in the belt. So we think about this and we just observe that we just derived or establish what we call an ordinary differential equation, an ODE. Uh, you can classify it mathematically. It only has one derivative. That's the highest derivative, so it's first order. And we look at it. We have t on this side, t on that side. It's basically linear. There's no t squared term uh, to make it nonlinear. And you have this constant coefficient mu sub s. So our independent variable, theta, is going to go from 0 over to some beta, some angle of contact. We could, as I had it, illustrate like this. So theta is 0, and then theta, theta is equal to beta. So beta would be that length of the angle of contact. And that's our independent variable. And our dependent variable, tension, is a function of theta. So the tension over here, when theta is equal to 0, is T1. And the tension in the cable coming out, uh, or the belt, at tension at uh, theta equal to beta is equal to T2. So what we're looking for is to take this ordinary differential equation with some initial or boundary condition, I'd like to call it initial condition or boundary condition, either way, which is just that t at theta is equal to zero, and that's equal to t1. And then solve it uh, for theta as a function, t is a function of theta, and then apply it at beta to get the relationship, what t2, how t2 relates to t1. Well, how do we solve this ODE? Well, separate and integrate. So when you separate, you put dt over t equal to mu sub s d theta. Do I have all of the dependent variables on one side of the equation, all the independent variables and its differentials on the other side? Yes, that's properly separated. Let's go ahead and integrate. Integrate. When we integrate this dt over t, ah, that reminds us, you know, the integral of 1 over x dx. What is that? That's equal to the natural log of t. Mu sub s is a constant. It can come outside the integral. The integral d theta, that's the easiest one. It's like the integral dx is just simply x. We love that integral. So it's just mu sub s times theta. We have a constant of integration. Let's go ahead and apply this boundary condition. So the natural log at t1 or when theta is equal to 0 is equal to mu sub s times 0, so that term goes away, is equal to our constant of integration. So our constant of integration is a natural log of t1. Put it back into our general equation. So we just rewrite this, getting rid of that constant. We get the natural log of t is equal to mu sub s theta plus the natural log of t1. Well, bring this over to this side, so you get minus the natural log of t1. Then you recall 
that the natural log of A minus the natural log of B is the natural log of A divided by B, just rule uh, associated with algebra with the natural log. And so you get the natural log of T divided by T1 is equal to mu sub theta. And then you can get the equation that exponentiate both sides. T as a function of theta is equal to T1 e exponential of mu sub s theta. This I should have put an s on there. And then you can say, well, let's go ahead and apply this equation when theta is equal to beta. Well, t when theta is equal to beta is t2. And when you plug it into that equation, that's t1 e to the mu, not minus, e to the mu sub s beta. So there is our equation. So we got te uh, the tension as a function of any angle and then applied it at the particular ending angle, which is beta, and you get this belt equation. So what we set out to show, we were able to demonstrate, and that, this is derived in most textbooks.